So I'd like to talk to you about ruminants. Uh, you're probably familiar with some ruminants. There are a lot of them. Uh, and some of them we have a closer relationship with others because we farm them. Uh, but the one thing that they all have in common is that they all have a rumen. Uh, so this is a specialized stomach that contains a complex microbial environment, uh, a, a community even. Uh, and that microbial community is responsible for breaking down the plant matter for the animal uh, and helping it to digest um, very complex uh, feed. And also some of these microbes produce methane, which I will come back to in a moment. So why do we care what's in the rumen microbiome? Repeatedly, we have found that there is an association between the community and the microbiome and feed efficiency. And in a food production animal, that is of particular interest. Uh, additionally, around 14% of human-associated methane production is thought to come from farmed ruminants. Uh, and of course, the global warming potential of methane is much higher than that of carbon dioxide. So it would be great to be able to reduce that uh, in, in farmed animals. And of course, methane production also wastes carbon and energy that would otherwise be available to the animal. Uh, and finally, this is a natural system for breaking down complex carbohydrates, which is exactly the sort of thing that we want for biofuels. So there's a whole bunch of interesting things in the rumen microbiome that we could look into. So we spend quite a lot of time improving the genetics of our farm animals uh, and improving the nutrition of our farm animals, but we don't actually understand the first thing that happens to the food once the animal's eaten it. So it would be great to understand more about that and if we can intervene in any way, if we can influence the microbiome to improve any of these traits or to reduce diseases and methane emissions. Uh, and additionally, as I said, if we can find any enzymes that are useful in biofuels, even better. So until recently, the classification of rumen microbiome samples has been very poor. Uh, so this uh, plot on the right here is uh, 42 different uh, rumen microbiome samples sequenced with short reads uh, and classified using Kraken. So the blue line is the default Kraken database. Uh, and as you can see, you're lucky if you get 3 or 4% of your reads classifying. Uh, if you throw in all of the bacterial, archaeal, and fungal genomes in NCBI, you do get above 5%, but not by far. Uh, and if you throw in the Hungate 1000 genomes, which are genomes from cultured rumen microbiomes specifically, you get, if you're lucky, 15% maybe, just under. Uh, so most of your data you're not actually using if you're classifying reads uh, against any of these databases, because these databases are massively underrepresenting these microbes. So of course the gold standard for obtaining these genomes is through culture, as Hungate 1000 has been doing. But this is very expensive and very time consuming, and in fact many of these microbes will not culture using current methods. Many of them rely on each other to exist, so we can't isolate them. Uh, so sequencing is a, an attractive option here for actually getting these genomes out and, and uh, assembling them. But of course, assembly from a comp complex sample, as we know, is very difficult. So we can and we have done this using short read sequencing. Uh, there's a few problems with this. As with assembling anything else from short reads, they tend to be very fragmented and missing repetitive regions. And particularly for microbes uh, from a microbiome sample, they're often missing things like the 16S, which if you are trying to use 16S analyses, you'd really like the, the database to include the 16S and what, what genome it came from. Uh, so yes, yeah, the highly, the highly fragmented, missing repetitive regions. Uh, there's potential for contamination during the binning process. Um, and the definition of a complete genome is not actually all that complete. So there's various different cutoffs that people use to, to accept a genome as complete. Uh, and that's usually roughly around 80% of the genes that we expect to be there are there. That's a complete genome. Uh, and we'll accept up to about 10% contamination. So there could be bits of other genome in there. Um, and there could be quite a bit of it missing as well. Uh, this paper... The one at the bottom is about to come out in uh, Nature Biotech, and that does include some of the work I'm talking about today. So we can do better. So we've started using uh, lumen ion sequence beads a couple of years ago. Um, unfortunately, we do use bead beating, as Rob said. You really need to use quite vigorous extraction methods to get your DNA out. So that does limit our read lengths a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to primarily talk about this one beef cow that we sequenced two years ago on three flow cells because I'm still playing with the data. Um, but I've also sequenced five dairy cows that I will, uh, I will briefly discuss as well at the end. So this is just the overall protocol, so it's very simple. Uh, we're actually using DNA that is left over from the Illumina sequencing, so we haven't actually done anything special at all during the extraction. 
Uh, we've sequenced using 1D. Uh, the base calling for the beef cow is on the most recent version of Albacore, and the newer samples are all on Guppy. Uh, assembled with Canu. We have used other assemblers as well, but I'm not talking about them today. Uh, and polishing with Nanopolish and Racon. So this is the first uh, sample, the one that I'm going to talk about. Now, you may notice that these yields are very bad. Uh, and they were, in fact, very bad at the time as well, for two years ago. Um, but if you take these, these reads, they've got a pretty good N50. If you take all of these reads and put them through Canoe to assemble them, we get a very nice assembly out. So we've got an N50 here of 270 KB, uh, total length of about 180 megabases. And if we just zoom in on some of the longer stuff here, you'll notice that we have quite a few circular contigs here. Uh, and just for context, this one here is our longest contig at 3.8 megabases. Uh, and this is our longest circular contig at 3.1 megabases. Uh, so we've got quite a lot of contigs that are roughly the size you would expect for a whole genome. And we've got a lot of circular contigs that look like they probably are complete genomes. Uh, in total, we have 31 circular contigs. Uh, this is using Canu. Uh, with some of the other assemblers, we do get more circular contigs than usually the smaller ones. Uh, but I'm just going to focus on these ones for now. Uh, so I'm going to go into more detail on the two that I've highlighted here just for now. First one is Prevotella Copri. So this is the first publicly available single contig assembly for this uh, bacteria uh, by about two days. I think there's a, an, it was a, a nanopore assembly of the, of the same uh, genome came out shortly afterwards. Um, but as you can see, CheckM, for those who don't know, is a, a bit like Busco. It's a tool that uses a set of genes that are expected to appear in the genome uh, and tells you what percentage of them are there um, and uh, if there's any contamination. So this is very complete with very low contamination. Uh, the plot uh, at the top on the right there is uh, comparing our contig to the reference genome, uh, which is in 27 contigs. Uh, and you can see there's quite a bit of agreement. There's a few differences. Um, but the plot at the bottom there is actually one of our other samples. So this is from a different cow, uh, sequenced using a different technology, uh, and assembled using a different method. And you can see they agree with each other extremely well albeit in many more contigs. Uh, and of course, there are a few regions you can see there are missing from the Illumina assembly that are incorporated into this contig. Uh, so next, this is a Pseudomonas. This is actually a novel species. Uh, you can see it doesn't really agree very well with its closest relative in the database, which is Pseudomonas ruminatium. Uh, but again, it agrees quite well with one of our Illumina assemblies that nicely supports uh, that this is a, a well-assembled contig. Uh, so this is the first assembly of the species. Uh, it is circular, and again, CheckM says that it is very complete with very low contamination. So our smaller circular contigs, uh, there are 26 of the smaller ones in this particular assembly. Uh, four of them have been previously identified as plasmids, uh, and one of these carries at least three antimicrobial resistance genes on it. Uh, it actually has a couple more that have annotated as incomplete, but that may be there are still some indels left on this assembly that we need to smooth out. Um, so 14 of the uh, circular contigs appear to be novel phages. Uh, we also have a bunch of uh, linear contigs that look like phages as well. Some of these are probably integrated prophages, but many of them appear to be the actual phage. Uh, so the other circular contigs we expect to be novel plasmids, and this is roughly in keeping with the amount of novelty we'd expect to see in the sample. So I mentioned that uh, the Illumina assemblies don't do very well with 16S. Uh, so even if you assemble thousands of, of assemblies with Illumina, if you don't have the 16S, there's a lot of people you're not really helping there. Uh, so what we can see here is that the Nanopore assembly found many more 16S genes than the Illumina assembly did, uh, and a lot more of those were complete. Uh, and in fact, once you put this Illumina assembly through the binning process, these are all gone. So you don't really get your 16Ss out at all. Similar story with the antimicrobial resistance genes. So many of these are complete in the nanopore assembly, whereas the Illumina assembly did find more of them, but they were in teeny tiny pieces. Uh, and most of them were at the very start or very end of the contig. So this is one of those features that appears to break the Illumina contigs. I mentioned we wanted to find enzymes of use in biofuels. Uh, we can identify polysaccharide utilization loci in bacteroidetes. Um, and in our Prevotella copri genome, we found 25 of these, including one that was greater than 50 KB in size. 
Uh, and we would not be able to see this if we had only assembled it with the Illumina data. So I mentioned that we have five more samples that we have recently uh, sequenced. So the first thing to note here is what a couple of years ago took us three flow cells to get, we can now comfortably get with one flow cell. Um, some of these have slightly lower yields, and that is actually because we had less starting DNA available for those. Um, but overall, the yields are very good. Uh, the N50s are a little bit worse. That's probably due to sample handling more than anything else. Uh, but when we put these samples through Canu or any of the other assemblers to assemble them, uh, they do much worse. Uh, so for some of these, you'll notice that the longest contig is actually shorter than the N50 of the first sample, which was massively disappointing. We were quite looking forward to just getting lots of circular contigs out of these rumens. Um, but if you take that first sample and you trim the reads down so the N50s match the other samples, or you subsample so that the yields match the other samples, it's still far, far better. This is it, this just a much better assembly, no matter what you do to, to that data set. Uh, so if we have a look at what one of these data sets looks like, it's a big mess. We've got lots of short contigs and this big tangled mess of unresolved contigs. Um, now, this is we've decided this is probably down to the fact that dairy cows and beef cows are different. Uh, so this is what it looks like if you classify the data from the beef cow, this is the population structure that comes out. Uh, but in contrast, if we look at the dairy cows, they look more like this. Uh, so if you follow me on Twitter, you've probably heard me complaining about Prevotella, uh, because over half of the data is from a single genus. Uh, so this has the effect of lowering the coverage of all the other species in the sample, uh, and also, there's th the strain differences in Prevotella, and there's a sequencing error, and there's, d as you've said, uh, someone over there just said that there's, there's different structural variants in, in all of these. There's probably a very wide diversity of Prevotella in these samples, and it does not assemble well. And if we have a look at what's in that hairball that did not resolve, it's almost entirely Prevotella, about 98% Prevotella. So just to wrap up, uh, the rumen microbiome contains an abundance of undiscovered species. Uh, if anything, there's, there's far too much interesting stuff in this uh, data set to look at, uh, which is a quite a nice problem to have. Uh, and long reads can assemble whole genomes from complex micro microbiomes into a single contig in some samples. Uh, and more continuous genomes are, of course, uh, desirable for databases and for the discovery of functional elements. Uh, and the quality of the assembly can be greatly affected by what's actually in there. So I'm often asked how much yield or how much coverage someone needs to assemble their microbiome. N no idea. What is it? Where's it come from? What's in it? Of course, you don't already know what's in it before you sequence it, so it's a very difficult question to answer. And in fact, adding more yield to it may not actually help. So I'd like to thank everyone uh, involved in these projects. So Rob Stewart and Mick Watson, uh, are primarily responsible for the short read assemblies I mentioned. Um, and Mick Watson and Christine Tate Burkard pay me, so thank you. Um, and also at Shruk, that's where we've got the samples from and where the DNA extractions were done. Uh, so thank you for listening and thanks to Nana Paul for inviting me. <laughs>